two years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're with you live from one until three. Coming up this afternoon, it's a total Tory wipeout as a new poll reveals the Conservatives are on course for their worst ever general election result. Meanwhile in Scotland, new hate crime laws come into effect today despite widespread condemnation as critics say they could have a chilling effect on freedom of speech. And unperturbed by an international manhunt, it appears the gourmet gangster Christy Kinahan has been posting hundreds of reviews and pictures online from his alleged hideout in Dubai. All of that's coming up, but first, let's get to the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Good afternoon. Hundreds of patients have died unnecessarily each week in England due to A&E waits. That's the finding of a new study from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. It found there was likely to be an excess death for every 72 patients who spent 8 to 12 hours in the emergency department. And the longer the wait, the greater risk of death. Poppy Coburn from The Telegraph told Talk today it's just another sign the system is in crisis. Absolutely the opposite of what you want to be hearing. You want to be thinking... When you're in the A&E ward, you're going to be safer. But a friend of mine had to go to A&E recently and said it was just unbelievable. The, the, just, there's not enough staff around. There are people sitting out in the corridor, the waits are over 12 hours, if you're lucky. I think it probably shows that we cannot just wait until the election to put off the crisis in the NHS. A major new poll suggests we could see a Tory wipeout at the next election with the possibility of just 98 members of Parliament. The Salvation poll is predicting the worst ever Conservative Party defeat in history, which could see 14 serving ministers and even the PM Rishi Sunak himself losing their seats. It's being branded an extinction-level event. But the Sun's Rod Little told Talk Today that's what people always say and it won't turn out to be true. The Conservative Party has remarkable uh, survivability uh, 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 talents and has shown that over the years, uh, sadly, in my, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, uh, because I, it may well have outgrown its usefulness, given that there is nothing you can really say that stands for Conservatism anymore when you look at the various factions within the Conservative Party pulling in very, very different directions indeed. Energy bills have now fallen to their lowest level in two years as the new price cap comes into force. A typical amount for gas and electricity has dropped by an average of £238 to £1,690 a year. But experts are advising people to continue saving as bills remain expensive. Seven major bills, including council tax, water and broadband, went up today. Meanwhile, lower-paid workers are getting a pay rise. The government's increased the minimum wage by more than a pound for the first time. The national living wage is rising from £10.42 an hour to £11.44. Scotland's new hate crime laws have come into force. New offences have been introduced for stirring up hatred based on prejudice towards protected characteristics. They include age, disability, religion, sexual orientation and gender. And the X Factor star Lucy Spragan has announced Simon Cowell will walk her down the aisle when she marries Amelia Smith in June. Spragan left the show in 2012 under difficult circumstances and became friends with the judge years later. She told the son she asked him if he'd give her away before they went swimming in the sea together. He said it would be an honour. That's all for now. Time for your weather with Joe Wheeler. <laughs> Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello there. Well, the weather's going to stay pretty unsettled over the next few days with showers or longer spells of rain. And we've certainly seen some very heavy rain working its way northwards through the country today, giving some particularly bad driving conditions. A lot of surface water and spray on the roads and a lot of gloom around as well. Low cloud making it very misty and murky. It's an onshore flow into the northeast, so it will be quite chilly in those areas too. In contrast, northwestern parts of Scotland should see some decent sunshine and will probably stay dry as well. And then to the south, well, a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. These showers heavy and thundery at times. However, they will become increasingly confined to southern coasts. So a drying out process as we go into the evening. But then also this rain making its way further north into Scotland and returning to northwestern parts of England. Now, of course, all that cloud and rain does mean that it's going to be fairly mild. Most places frost free tonight away from the extremely far north. And then through the course of Tuesday, well, that rain hangs around particularly over central and eastern parts of Scotland. To the south, we'll see another mixture of sunshine and showers and temperatures into the mid-teens Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. We have lots coming up over the next few hours, including the most dire poll yet for the Tories. My heart bleeds as Downing Street scrambles to convince voters that Britain's economy is on the mend. We'll also take a look at controversial new crime laws in Scotland, which promise to crack down on hate, but exclude crimes linked with misogyny. And we'll tell you all about the drugs kingpin, who's getting away with leaving restaurant reviews online, despite being one of the world's most wanted men. And today we're joined in the studio uh, with our presenter's friend, uh, former Metropolitan Police Detective Peter Blexley, who's on Talk TV more than we are. That's so right, good to have you on Lex. board, Peter. Uh, listen, uh, I'm going to get today's show off uh, with a special announcement. Ah, it's something good for me. I've got I know. A, I've got a big national newspaper column starting next Monday uh, in the most unlikely of papers, uh, but they seem to be interested in a kind of alternative view. Diversity. So uh, next Monday, uh, my column starts in The Guardian. There you go. Yeah, uh, and well, I'm looking forward to reading it. It'll really uh, shake up, I think, uh, the sort of readership of The Guardian, something they've been looking to do ever since they keep posting all those annoying banners online saying, please give us money, we're running out of cash. And I've always said, well, do you know what? Maybe you should uh, address a, a bigger audience and then you might get more readers. And so I think having you on board is a really great solution to their financial problems. Well, I certainly feel they, they feel that I'm an alternative voice. Nobody's pretending that I'm going to be a sort of regular Guardian type. Uh, but I am going to address those issues that concern the Guardian a lot, you know, diversity, inclusivity, workers' rights, Keir Starmer's upcoming premiership. Uh, so it's an exciting time, uh, Peter, for me to uh, launch my new column in The Guardian. Many congratulations. Thank I'm you, absolutely thrilled for you. In fact, this evening I'm going to go home and celebrate with some lentil soup <laughs> and, a, and a nuts cutlet. <laughs> nuts cutlets. Yeah. And some non-alcoholic <laughs> wine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, that's Monday week. Uh, I'll Not talk... Wait. We'll talk more about it as the show unfolds. Uh, I'm slightly surprised, I must say. Uh, but uh, I'm uh, encouraged by the Guardian's uh, willingness to embrace an alternative view, and that'll be me. Uh, so uh, despite what I genuinely feel about the Guardian, it's finally going to be a good your paper. Newspaper? Well, it is now. It yeah, is now. It now, is now. Now that I'm going to be in it. In all uh, seriousness, it's an absolute triumph for your agent, isn't it? It is. I mean, it I really is. I don't know how she managed it. I don't know, how, know how she managed it. <laughs> but, uh, she wrote me last week said, you're not going to believe this. I said, yeah. well, uh, I think I've got you a column because I've been looking Hi. to get a column. And yeah. I said, so I said, what paper? I'm thinking Telegraph, maybe. Yeah. Maybe the Sun or the Mail or something like that. Yeah. She said, you're not going to believe it. I said, what? She said, The Guardian. She, I said, you're right, I don't believe it, but it's true. Monday week, next week, I start in The Guardian Fabulous. with my own column, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, meanwhile, uh, another big story we're going to be covering uh, today is up in Scotland, their new draconian new hate laws come into play. Oh, no. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, this will mean that even if you're sitting around your dinner table with your family or your friends at your own home, you better be careful well, what you say. Let's just uh, say what it is. As soon as you make 
saying things or passing comments or having an opinion illegal in some way, however distasteful or hurtful other people might find that opinion to be, that is fascism. That is what that is. That is authoritarianism. That's the sort of thing they do in North Korea. So slow clap. Yeah. Older Hamza Youssef yep. for introducing that to Scotland. Great. People of Scotland, watch out, because apparently the police in Scotland said they're going to have to investigate every single reported incident of hate speech. They won't have much time to do anything else. Um, and it's just oh, it beggar's belief, doesn't it? In, well, in Peter, you, we'll come back to this story later on, because it is a big story. This is a major day in Scottish history, uh, the day when free speech... Uh, was crushed, to be honest with you. And police chiefs up there have said on a serious practical basis that this is going to make their life a nightmare because anyone with an axe to grind uh, is going to start reporting their enemies to the police just to get them in trouble because the only criterion uh, for breaking this hate hurts, hate crime laws will be that I decide you have committed a hate crime against me. So I can just say, I'll go to the police and say, Peter Blexi uh, said some horrible things. Uh, why do you think that they're a hate crime? Because I do. In that case, sir, they are a hate crime. I mean, the mind boggles. And the particularly odious element to it, I think, is that it applies in people's own homes. Yeah. Sick. I mean, how Orwellian, how 1984 is that? And how are they going to police it? I think Kev's absolutely right when you highlight the fact that if people are activists and they have a particular axe to grind, and say, for example, they have JK Rowling in their sites... Oh, you know they do. Yeah. Then, of course, what are they going to do? They are going to report yeah. hate crime after hate crime after hate crime. And this comes on the back of an announcement from Police Scotland just a couple of weeks ago that there are tens of thousands of crimes that they will not investigate. You could right. not make this nonsense up. I think what I find very, very scary about all of this, we've had legislation in place already uh, to protect the human rights, if you will, of various minority groups and so forth. But what we've seen in the last couple of years is the virulence by which the other side of the trans debate to women who want to protect single-sex spaces will go about abusing women, shouting at women, intimidating women, sometimes even resorting to physical violence against women, and they are the first ones to jump up and down and say, oh, you've put out a tweet, I'm telling the police. And all of a sudden, you find a woman who said, I don't want men in women's changing rooms, gets a knock at the door from a bobby. Now, what is so alarming about this Scottish legislation is it says, oh, that's all fine. Oh, gosh, if you're a woman and you say, I don't want a jock in a frock in Scotland entering ladies loose, thank you very much, you could face seven years in prison, and yet women themselves are not offered... Yeah. The same protection. No protections for women within this legislation whatsoever. And I'm a big fan of that expression that says, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. I think that's really applicable in many, many situations. So what's going to happen now with this lunatic Scottish government? I'm sure they're going to make indifference a crime. That's what they'll do next. So even if you're completely indifferent to something, I mean, that's a slippery slope that they're on. Right. It is utterly ludicrous, dangerous, Orwellian, and a, a sign of just how bonkers mm. the Scottish Parliament has got. And there will be many within Police Scotland, that, that kind of schizophrenic organisation in many regards, that will be chomping at the bit to lay their hands on people. Well, I just want to apologise to any of you in Scotland who may have found what I said offensive. Uh, I personally do not believe that uh, women can have men's genitalia and I personally don't particularly want opportunists coming into changing rooms. But I'm south of Hadrian's Wall, so I should hopefully be safe. Yeah, it's just unbelievable that Hamza Youssef thinks this is... It. I mean, uh, Sturgeon was the same. They have no uh, understanding of liberty, personal liberty or freedom. The fact these people actually want to legislate about what Scottish people can say in their own homes it's just staggering to me, absolutely breathtaking, a really dark day, not only in Scottish history, but in British history. Shame on you, Yousef. Uh, so today we are asking, do Scotland's draconian new hate crime laws put free speech <laughs> in danger? Uh, the answer is yes, by the way. Uh, but uh, do give us a call. Let us know what you think. 0344 499 1000. You can text us, write talk at the beginning of your message and send it to 87222. Or you can tweet us on X at Talk TV. Very interested to hear what you think about what the hell is going on up in Scotland today.
to our top story now. And Rishi Sunak has been dealt yet another blow as the latest polls reveal the Conservatives are on course for their worst ever general election result. A seat-by-seat -seat analysis gives the Tories fewer than 100 constituencies compared with a possible 468 for Labour. It also shows Reform UK could cost the Conservative Party up to 50 seats. But the Prime Minister is determined to stay positive, with Downing Street hailing the government's bumper package of economic reforms. Their words, not mine. In a statement released last night, uh, joining us now is The Times' chief political correspondent, Aubrey Allegretti. Uh, thanks for coming on board, Aubrey. Uh, why, I mean, you know, we're getting very used to this kind of story, you know, the Tories uh, proceeding unchecked towards some kind of massacre at the next election. Uh, every day and every way these stories get worse. But this is the worst I've seen so far, that they could end up with fewer than uh, uh, 100 seats, 98 seats, and that uh, Keir Starmer could end up with as many as, I think it's four over nearly 500 seats with a 286 majority. Why is this picture now emerging, not just of electoral defeat, but of some kind of electoral Armageddon for the Tories? Why now? Well, I think that, first of all, most Tory MPs will publicly sort of brush this off as being quite far-fetched. I don't think they'll believe that they could be reduced in number to something as small as fewer than 100 MPs. But I think secretly they do fear that something in this direction is possible. And that leaves open the question of what they will do on May the 3rd in the aftermath of the local elections when Rishi Sunak leads the party to potentially quite a, a big drubbing. Some MPs I spoke to really sort of think that that is the moment where he could be forced out. They point to 2019 when Theresa May was still leader of the Conservative Party and led the party into the European elections, their worst uh, electoral defeat in history at a national election. And one of the MPs I spoke to said to me, we need the electorate to deliver the punishment beating and then we can remove them. So there are still a, a number of weeks where Rishi Sunak really has to watch his own back. And does he have to watch his own back in his own constituency? Is he one of the high profile Conservatives who may be dethroned uh, whenever the general election is? Yeah, this MRP effectively said that he was about 2.5 points clear of second place in his constituency. So he was potentially even in uh, potentially to be drummed out of Parliament, which would obviously put the legendary Portillo moment where Michael Portillo was um, forced out of uh, uh, as being an MP in 1997 to shame. So I suspect that the Prime Minister probably isn't too worried about his own seat. It should, on paper, be a very safe one. But don't forget that the Conservatives did lose Selby and Ainsty, which is a constituency not too far and within the same region of North Yorkshire from Rishi Sunak's Richmond constituency. Uh, obviously, that by-election uh, happened, I think, last year. So there were different sort of factors and circumstances around it, but it did show that Labour could make significant headway in parts of the country that they had previously struggled with. Um... Rishi Sunak seems to feel that the way forward for the Tories is to say, oh, look, the economy's turning a corner, uh, inflation's going down, we're not going to be putting interest rates up anymore, uh, everything is hunky-dory economically and financially, or at least we're heading in the right direction. Uh, a lot of Tories, uh, particularly backbench Tories, just don't feel that that's nearly enough. And you have to feel they've got a point, haven't they? He's going to do more... He's going to have to do more than just say, oh, things are a bit better financially. He's got to pull more spectacular rabbits out of the hat if he's to turn this uh, sinking ship around, hasn't he? Well, I think there are some in government who feel slightly frustrated because they've obviously announced uh, two consecutive 2p cuts in national insurance, totaling 4p, and that hasn't seemed to move the polls much. We've got the free uh, childcare offer that's going to be expanded uh, from tomorrow, which is going to be announced as well, which is potentially saving the government says up, up to about £7,000 per child. And then you've got the news today about the national living wage, which is obviously the minimum wage for over 21-year-olds rising. So it hopes that all those things and a combination as well of the Bank of England potentially reducing interest rates up to three times before the next general election will make people feel better. But I think one thing that can't be ignored is, the, is what's called fiscal drag. Effectively, the government freezing tax bans so that people are being 
dragged into paying income tax for the first time or dragged into pay, paying higher rates of tax, that does mean that all of the sort of good that the Conservatives are trying to do, if you like, by reducing taxes is being slightly negated by the consequences of fiscal drag and freezing those tax bans because ultimately people aren't then feeling better off. I mean, looking at the polls as they are now, it seems to me that the Labour Party don't need to do anything at all to walk in to number 10. Uh, and yet it seems to me they have their own internal headaches. We seem to think that they're just, uh, you know, enjoying a, a day in the sunshine at the moment. But they've had mass resignations over their sort of moving to the centre ground on issues such as green policy and sort of uh, social and cultural policies. Do you think that could be a situation that will worsen for them as time moves forward? Keir Starmer still seems in a, in a relatively strong position. I mean, Conservative strategists think that support for the Labour Party is quite shallow, it's quite weak. Um, there are still lots of don't knows, i.e. people who haven't confidently said that they're going to convert from uh, Conservative voting in 2019 to Labour in 2024. But I would suggest that Labour managing to keep a headway of basically around 15 to 20 points ahead in the opinion polls for over a year does suggest that its support is solidifying and if the conservatives wanted to turn things around they're re leaving it rather late in the day to sort of try and pull off that feat so i suspect that Keir Starmer does think it's a case of sort of sit tight uh, don't make any mistakes they are obviously coming um sort of being asked a lot about what they do on childcare. i mentioned that earlier the provision for two-year-olds and above is coming in from tomorrow and Labour hasn't yet said how it would manage to match what the government's offering, which obviously comes with a very hefty price tag as well. So there will be traps that the Conservatives try and spring for Labour. But um, as one MP said to me recently, people just aren't listening to us anymore. So, you know, do the Conservatives really think they can pull it back? Well, some think that, you know, it's, it's, it's over even six months before the election. And others, Aubrey, think that uh, Rishi's uh, policies going forward, his direction of travel is actually going to end up being worse for the Tories if he hangs on in there, if he stays till uh, October, maybe even later. They say with each day, the Tories get worse at the polls. They go further down. Uh, so uh, many are saying, including David Frost, David Frost says every day the polls get worse for us. So many in the Tory party are, sa are saying, why don't you, Rishi, put us out of our misery earlier before it gets even worse. Uh, he's not listening. He, he, that, that, that's a case of someone who's not listening. I mean, he just somehow seems to have convinced himself that somehow if the economy gets a bit better, people have got a couple more quid in their pocket, they'll all vote Tory. They won't. Uh, do you think there's any chance that he'll listen to people like David Frost and say, let's go now, let's just get rid of this, let's get it out of the way? Well, there was this argument advanced from about a year ago when our attention really turned to the timing of the general election, which was that actually some people thought it would be better to go early, relatively speaking, and for him to call the election and to coincide probably with the May local elections, obviously, on the 2nd um, of next month. But uh, it's never really kind of got much traction and senior figures in Downing Street advising Rishi Sunak are understood still to favour the kind of October November to sorry October to November window I think that's partly because of what I talked about before those priced in interest rates cuts also the prospect of the government hopefully it wants to get flights in the air to Rwanda which means that it can make more progress on the stop the boats pledge which obviously so far they've had limited success in dealing with they have reduced arrivals by around a third last year but we're already seeing the numbers tick up this year and I think the total number of arrivals is higher than last year so, again, the government wants a combination of uh, interest rate cuts, the Rwanda scheme sort of getting off the ground, and I think ultimately a sort of sense that Rishi Sunak's had longer to kind of deliver some of his longer-term priorities in office. Problem is that the longer you might stay in, the more you might build up resentment against you and then create a stronger motivation for people to turn out at the polls to try and turf you out. Well, still with us is former Met Police detective Peter Blexley. Peter... <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to be mild how I say this. You've, you've been around the block a few times. You've lived a few lives uh, on this planet. Do you think when you look at the big issues facing the Conservative Party day, uh, today, the, the, the big economic insecurity faced by the country, rising cost of living, uh, mass crises when it comes to illegal inward immigration and also legal migration, that the Labour Party coming in are going to wave a magic wand and make it better? 
absolutely not. And the thought of Starmer potentially having a 250-seat majority, for example, quite frankly, terrifies me because this country is in such a state on so many fronts and it will require cash to fix many of the things that are fundamentally broken. And there isn't the cash around. If there was, the Tories would be splurging it everywhere now in a last-ditch bid to get the railways better, to get the water companies performing better, to get the NHS waiting list down and the NHS, generally speaking, working better, to get the police performing more efficiently. They'd be spending the cash if it was there. But the bottom line is, with such a sluggish economy, there isn't the tax revenues that I'm sure the government would like. And therefore, when Labour come in, if they do come in, what are they, where are they going to magic all this money up from? And quite frankly, if I hear another thing is going to be funded from the non-DOM abolition of that tax status, then I, I, I'll be beyond despair because, as I understand it, with this simple one provision that they promised to include, we're going to colonise Mars, we're going to send HS2 round the entire globe and goodness knows what else, what else they're going to do. And it's just not going to be there. Uh, there's another aspect to why I think the Tories are doomed. I mean, people are very fond of saying, oh, it's the pound in people's pockets, it's the economic downturn, it's uh, utility bills rocketing, the price of everything going up. Yeah, of, co of course that's very important. But here's another reason why I think Rishi and his Tory cronies are utterly doomed. Is Just look around you. Feel this country right now. It is falling apart at the seams. Every weekend, we seem to give over our streets to Muslim marches, uh, people chanting against this country. Uh, there is a sense of lawlessness. Crimes are not being prosecuted. Uh, shoplifting is endemic, and so on and so forth. And, we, of course, we know about our borders, which are not maintained. There's a sense that this country ha is and has fallen apart at the seams. I've invented a little bit of a party game. Well, it's, it's a bit gloomy, actually. But anybody <laughs> whose company I come into, I say, give me an example of what makes you proud about Britain. Mm. And people pause and look and sometimes scratch their heads yeah. and often can't come up with an answer. That's really sad, isn't yeah, it? It's pretty it's tragic. I was just doing it in my own head there, thinking what makes me <laughs> bad. And everything I came it. up with was something in the past. Yeah, exactly <laughs> really right. Nothing exactly today. Right. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, uh, you make me proud. And you make me Especially, proud, Especially, I can't wait for so a new... Uh, the colleague. three of us make each other yeah, proud. Yeah, exactly. Now, coming up after the break, senior Tories have backed a proposal to publish an annual league table of migrant groups and the crimes they commit. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on, <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for, minutes, for, Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Well, now, apparently, senior Tory MPs have backed plans to release an annual league table on migrant crime rates in England and Wales. If the plans go ahead, the authorities will be able to more easily identify the migrants' nationalities with the highest rates of crime, allowing the Home Office to institute stricter visa and deportation policies. And we're still joined in the studio by Peter Brexy. Yeah, uh, Alex has been, uh, I, I don't want to say going on about this, because I think you've been making a good <laughs> Banging point. Banging on. Al Alex has been making this point now for some, re some time. It is quite clear that all, of all these migrants coming across the channel and the other methods they use to break into our country illegally, uh, that significant numbers of them are committing crimes and significant number of those crimes are sexual crimes. Now, Alex's point, and I think it's quite right, in a free country, surely, we have the right to see the breakdown of those statistics. Hitherto, our government, our betters, our le dear leaders have decided... Uh, in the name of lack of transparency, we're not allowed to see those figures. Now, uh, it looks like they could be on the point of changing their mind, so at least we know what these people are up to when they get here. It's about time they told us the truth, isn't it? Absolutely. The statistics are widely available for many European countries. And I commend Alex. She's made a very forceful and well-reasoned argument yep, for this I agree. consistently over a number of weeks that I've been listening. And it's absolutely right. We do as a nation, fully deserve to know what percentages of crimes are being committed by people who enter this country illegally or are seeking asylum and the such like, and the percentages of the types of crime by breakdown. Each crime, each percentage, yeah. so we can have a true, accurate picture. It's all well and good for us to be utterly outraged, like we were, about Abdul Azedi, for example, the late Abdul Azedi, mm -hmm. But we need to know, because you can quite simply sit on your computer, go into any search engine and go, asylum seeker, convicted. Illegal immigrant, convicted. Make sure you've got some time on your hands, because mm. there'll be plenty of articles to read. But what we actually need, so that we can make uh, an accurate comment upon these kind of people is the stats. Right, and surely when you have statistics, you can actually build policy mm. off the back of this. And one thing that's really getting my goat is we saw those scenes, 2016, New Year's Eve in Cologne, where loads of young German girls were sexually assaulted, some of them even raped, in the, the, the busy square of that city. And it was pretty much all done 
by young men not from Germany. And if you look at the crime statistics in places like Denmark, places like Sweden, the Netherlands, Germany, this is being replicated time and time and time again. My own personal experience walking around London is that it's just not that easy anymore without street harassment. And what I don't understand is why so many people in positions of power are happy to mortgage women's safety at the altar of mass migration and political correctness. It is evil to do but, that. But you've nailed it as to why. Because you say positions of power. And with those positions of power come fat, handsome salaries. So they live a detached life far away from the travails of single women travelling on public transport, mm -hmm. for example, right. being harassed and assaulted on a daily, far too frequent basis... These people live those detached lives. They don't know the concerns. They don't engage with people who are suffering these crimes. And consequently, in their little world, oh, we'll just add another well, slice of fluffiness. Worse still, I was speaking to a middle-class friend of mine the other day and having this exact conversation. They said, oh, well, if I found that was happening in my neighbourhood, I would just move. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. It's all right if you got the money. Uh, still with Abdul Azidi. Uh, Alex was asking last week, because, uh, of course, he converted to Christianity and, despite converted. committing a sex offence, was allowed to stay because he's a good Christian, told all his mates, I'm still a good Muslim. And, indeed, when he was buried after throwing himself into the Thames, we think, uh, following that uh, alkaline attack on that poor lady who he nearly blinded in South London in Clapham, uh, he was buried as a full Muslim at a full Muslim uh, funeral. And Alex said, well, who's paying for that? Well, it turns out it's uh, an organisation called the Muslim Burial Fund, uh, which organised uh, and raised more than £6,000 £6, to lay Azidi to rest. Uh, uh, under the name of Abdul Wahid. In other words, <laughs> they, they, they lied about who they were raising money for. They didn't mention that he was a sex convictor, uh, a, a convicted sex assaulter, plus he was the uh, Clapham attacker. Mm. So this money was raised on false pretenses, yeah, Peter. Oh, but the brother died in suspicious circumstances. Yes. That's the wording used. He died tragically, don't Tragically, yeah. 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 Tragically. So that was the wording used in order to get people, perhaps, who had more money than sense to part with their cash so that he could have his burial. I've not got a problem with anybody having a burial with an element of dignity to it, but what I really take offence to is people raising cash under false pretences. Yeah. That's against the law, isn't it, officer? Well, quite possibly. I'm sure there's some legislation that may have covered that. Well, you, can't, you can't go around saying, oh, I'm mm. raising money, uh, it's for this guy, who's no. a saint, when, in fact, you're raising money for a rapist. That, that's got to be against yeah, the law. Just, uh, uh, obtaining money by deception could possibly yeah, fit yeah, those circumstances. Yeah, yeah. Now, sticking with uh, Abdul Azadi, uh, it was, I think, really, the case of Abdul Azadi really put in the crosshairs what's been going on in some churches around the country where asylum seekers are converting air quotes, to Christianity to then prevent themselves being deported, saying, oh, look, I, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, now if I go back home, I'm going to be persecuted. Well, James Cleverly, the Home Secretary, never one to take the blame or the responsibility himself, has turned around and told church leaders, you're not allowed to do this anymore. My argument is, let church leaders be church leaders and convert people to Christianity. Surely the buck stops with the Home Office. Yeah, well, just don't allow this to be a factor in asylum applications. Whether or not you convert to Christianity is irrelevant. Leave it like that. On this weekend, which is so important to many people of faith, particularly Christians, in fact, more important than Christmas mm. for many people to whom their faith is extremely important, I think it's rather apt that we discuss the role of the church in matters like this. I think if somebody chooses... To, to follow a faith of whatever shape or form that is, then that's entirely a matter for them. But should it actually be a factor in deciding whether they should be granted asylum to stay in this country? Right. I think the answer to that Has is a fundamental <laughs> no. Exactly. Whereas right. somebody who groped somebody's buttocks, which Azedi did, 
and then, on another occasion, exposed himself in decent exposure, I think they very much should right. be factors. Indeed. Uh, let's uh, Here's one for you, Peter. Interested to get your take <laughs> on it. Uh, a Met officer at one of these weekend demonstrations, a pro-Palestinian march, uh, where there are actually quite a significant number of Jewish people protesting as well. Uh, she complained to a copper about swastikas being carried, anti-Semitic swastikas being carried in the crowd. And the Met officer said, when you see a swastika, you have to take it into context. Yeah, you do, mate. Uh, let's have a look at uh, this incident unfolding before our very eyes. In what context is a swastika not anti-Semitic and destructive of the public order? That was my question. I don't have an in-depth knowledge of signs and symbols. I know the swastika was used by the Nazi party during uh, their inception and the period of them being in power in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. I am aware of that. I just can't believe this conversation is actually happening. So what, what, what exactly are you confused about? What, what I'm confused is how you don't... In what context a swastika is not anti-Semitic? This is what I want to know. Because, again... I, I suppose, to some, I don't know uh, how... Everybody would feel about that song. Uh, Peter, uh, Swastika, that is anti-Semitic. That's a hate crime, <laughs> isn't it, or something? This is, of course, <laughs> just a small clip of a ten-minute video as the Metropolitan Police chose to remind us all uh. earlier on today. But if that's their finest that they can offer... No wonder there's a crime wave. Well, I like no, his first statement. Ridiculous. I like his first statement. I know that the Nazis used to use swastikas. No flies on him. He Absolutely. went to school, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, th this is the point. The police keep coming. It's like the same for jihad. Oh, well, you need to although, although at first you might feel it's a cause to, a cause to slaughter and killing uh, of people who are not of the Muslim faith, uh, it's got other meanings as well. The police always looking for excuses not to do their job. I'll offer up a short alternative as to how that situation could have been dealt with. Yes, madam, you are clearly alarmed and distressed by what you saw. Where did you see it? When did you see it? Yeah. What's your name and address, please? I will have this matter reported up the chain right. of command. Thank you very much. Yeah. If How's only that? it worked How's that like for a bit that. Of police so here? I got a bit mugged up on Oxford Street and they didn't even bother replying, yeah. so I don't really uh, have great hopes that they're going to deal with this. Um, and, uh, well, actually, we're going to have a little break now. Go make a cup of tea, because when you're back, the King is reportedly in high spirits as he's been spotted out and about over the Easter weekend. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have moved another on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. I'm Alex Phillips, and this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the King is reported to have enormously enjoyed his first formal outing since the announcement of his cancer diagnosis earlier this year. Appearing at an Easter Sunday service at St George's Chapel in Windsor, Charles was met with heartfelt wishes and waves from many and was, according to a body language expert, delighted to be back in the company of the public. We're still, of course, joined by former Met Police Detective Peter Blexley. I mean, there's a little bit of a shining hope at Easter. Our king up and about, saying hello to the crowds, even doing a couple of handshakes there. I mean, we understand with chemotherapy treatment, there's a degree of shielding you have to bear in mind and make sure your immune system is as protected as possible. But, yeah, great to see him around and about on uh, Easter Sunday. Yeah, I'm sure his team will have advised him as to what was wise to do and what wasn't, but he certainly shook a fair few hands, didn't he? So whether they were frantically you know, using wipes thereafter, I don't know. But it was good to see him out. And the pleasure that his presence brings to so many people there. I mean, that's a reason to be, to, to be cheerful. I'm no rampant monarchist myself, but the family, the royal family, are loved by so many people mm -mm. that if it brings a bit of light into their lives... And I do, of course, have sympathy for the man who served the longest apprenticeship in the history of mankind, <laughs> um, right. only, only to fall ill soon after okay. taking over the job. I don't think there's any doubt that His Majesty is trying to send a, mess a message to the people. Him uh, going to this service and shaking hands and saying, I'm back in action. I mean, albeit in a kind of reduced way because apparently he didn't sit with the family, didn't sit with the rest of the congregation in the church uh, for those reasons you explained, Alex, because uh, he's uh, vulnerable at the moment to infections. But I think he's sending us a message. I'm getting better and I'm going to be better. I will be back to frontline royal duty. So that's yeah. good to see. I'll tell you what isn't good to see is what's going on in accident and emergency oh, in the gosh. departments all over the country. 250 50 a &E patients die each week unnecessarily due to long NHS waiting times. Isn't that special, Alex? This is abs absolutely alarming. And we're talking about just A&E here and people who are waiting and die waiting. Uh, if you extend those figures uh, and all-cause mortalities to the fact that the NHS is useless, whether it's a missed cancer diagnosis, a cancelled surgery, uh, just sheer incompetence, then I reckon now the mortality rate of the NHS falls apart is probably now nudging up to be higher than the death rate from COVID itself. And there's a big argument, of course, that all of these waiting lists came uh, as a result of a certain degree of COVID policy. And people at the time, like me, said, well, do you know, all this locking people up in their houses, closing hospitals, cancelling appointments, mm, do you think in the long run that the treatment is going to be a lot worse than the original diagnosis? And it seems to me that this is tragically coming to light. And what the hell? A junior doctor's playing at, still going on striking all of this. They're murderous. And where are the heads of these NHS trusts? Where are all the managers, senior managers in the NHS, who earn salaries bigger than the prime ministers? Mm. Where are they all? Where have they been? Where have they been cutting waste, increasing efficiencies, getting IT that actually works? Because they haven't done any of that. So what are they getting paid for? Mm. Yeah. It's absolutely scandalous. Public money, mm. shed loads of it, 
going into their bank accounts. Mm -mm. And what are we getting in return? Neglect and death. And the, the NHS has still got hundreds of fax machines. It still buys fax machines God. to send faxes to each other because no one else in the world uses fax machines anymore. Yeah. What the hell is that all about? And by the way, talking about uh, NHS hospital lists, uh, waiting lists, there was another pledge of Rishi Sunak. I will cut NHS waiting lists. They're getting worse and worse and worse, just like the migrant crisis. So another triumph for the man who is doomed right. to disaster. Well, you know, the thing is, this is not an option. The vast majority of people out there can't say, well, do you know what, I can't afford to wait any longer for my cancer scan or to sit 12 hours in A&E, so I'm just going to go somewhere privately. First of all, A&E is the only thing we've got, private or otherwise. Um, but also, a lot of people just can't afford that. The premium now on health insurance is through the roof. Actually, one of the reasons, the only reasons our economy has actually grown in the last couple of years is because of more people taking out private health insurance. What a damning indictment that is of the country. How do you judge the soul of a nation? I believe it's how you treat the vulnerable. Yeah. The young, the elderly, those with disabilities, and those who are unwell and in need of treatment. Clearly, the NHS is failing those people, and each and every death as a result of these atrociously long waiting times is a very, very sad indictment mm. upon those managers who have repeatedly not done their jobs and not run these hospitals efficiently. Yeah, the NHS says it hasn't got enough money. It gets about 200 billion quid <laughs> a year. Uh, they could save a more lot. More money than creases. They could like save a say. lot. Yeah, more money than creases. They could save a lot by not paying 3,500 medically unqualified middle managers £100,000 a year or more. It's obscene, it's grotesque. Uh, it is mismanagement on an epic scale. Uh, now, uh, plus, oh. not, not forgetting the diversity officers and all that, but uh, if we start uh, talking about what's wrong with the NHS, we'll be here all night. And here's another thing that's this wrong with the so NHS. Wrong. Nearly so 500,000 antidepressant anti prescriptions are being handed out to uh, lost and lonely kids every year, Peter. Uh, and uh, the real reason for this is they should be seeing psychiatrists or psychotherapists. They're not available, so we just medicate them. That's what we do now. We just medicate anybody who's a problem. So 500, half a million kids are being given antidepressants that they probably shouldn't be being given. Uh, and something like 4,000 of those prescriptions are for kids under the age of 10. It's ill. That's it's ridiculous. ridiculous. That about and I bet they've all got a smartphone. Yeah. You see, yeah. this is, is at the heart, I believe, of so much of, of what is wrong with the... Uh, with the younger generation, many of whom I know and love and adore, but some of them who are not disciplined by their parents or their carers so that their phone usage is not rationed or in some way controlled are on their phones forever and a day, from morn till night, on their phones. And what a sad, lonely or appalling kind of childhood and teenage years mm -mm. must that be. I had a football under my arm, yep. or I was riding a bike, yep. or I was going to play cricket, mm. or I was out with my mates when I was a kid, mm. having real fun times with human interaction. Yeah. I pity these kids on their phones, but where's the parents? Where's the parenting? Where's the discipline? Where's the rationing? Also, where is the child safeguarding? We were talking just earlier about uh, protecting women and not throwing women's lives on, on the altar of political correctness. I'm sorry, but these are little kids. They should not be getting antidepressants. What are the long-term no. implications of pumping these kids full of hormones instead of saying we need to deal with the underlying cause? I mean, look, the statistics suggest that those under 18, 44% is the increase in those now getting antidepressants since 2015. 2015, a decade ago, what emerged a decade ago? You just said it. Instagram, TikTok, all of those apps. Why aren't we saying to the sandal-wearing bros in Silicon Valley, this ends now. Stop pumping kids with algorithms that make them want to self-harm. Stop pumping kids with propaganda that makes them question their gender identity. Stop allowing kids to go on platforms such as TikTok where people bully each other, they get groomed. It's this? a wild... Just pull the bloody plug How already. Apologies for the word B-word. The well, genie's well, out of the lab. It. You're not, it's not going to happen, it? Plenty, is it? Plenty it's not of going to happen. Though. Regulate social media. Yeah, plenty. well, we won't. Parents are there to regulate it. That's what parents should do. Oh. Not allow their children to disappear up 
up into their room for hours upon hours with parents too frightened I to knock on that. the door and say, what are you doing? Can we look at your phone? Let's discuss this. Let's talk about the dangers of going online. What's out there? Because all the devils are out there. That's what's out there. Mm. Where's the parenting? Parents, I believe, are afraid in many regards to actually parent yeah. because they believe that if they discipline their child, their child won't love them anymore. And they're afraid of that. Whereas actually, in my experience of having raised three and been a part of raising many other members of, of my family, kids love discipline. Kids love boundaries mm. because it makes them feel secure. On a smartphone, there are no boundaries. Yeah. They will become insecure and therefore preyed upon. And from yeah. the age of 14 to 18, they're going to hate their parents anyway. That's what kids do. Uh, now, uh, let's talk about something far more important. Uh, scones, scones, vegan scones. Uh, we don't know whether it scones or scones. Scone. Oh, scones, all right. Scone. 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 You, you scone win. Scones. Well, we, we were sconers this morning. We would be sconers <laughs> now. Like scones. Uh, National Trust, uh, they have all these uh, stately homes and lovely places to visit of a weekend. Uh, and a lot of people like to go into the cafes and the restaurants there for scones and uh, cream and jam. Turns out the Nas National Trust, Peter, has been secretly, it's got 280 cafes, has been secretly selling the un suspecting public vegan scones and people are coming out of these canteens, say, canteens saying they taste like dry biscuits. Uh, we ought to have a choice whether or not we get vegan scones, right? First of all, it's a scone and they're... Scone, scone. Okay, scone, scone, right? scone. Okay, scone as in gone. Um, it is, of course, appalling that they're serving up vegan and I've heard, apparently, that they're dire... Yeah, apparently so. ..compared to the delicious, full, fat, lovely scone which so many of us enjoy. My wife and I went to a, a National Trust property just a few Sundays ago. It was a nice day. I think we paid about four and a half quid for the car parking, which I thought was a bit steep to start with. Anyway, we wanted to go for a walk around this gaff and it was 17 quid each. Oh, my <laughs> God. OK, 17 quid for a walk. Yeah. Well, that pays for a load of rainbow lanyards. Yeah. Uh, but Needless you know what really say, annoys me about mm. this whole vegan movement thing? All of these dairy replacement products, the seed oils and the oat milks, are really bad for you people. They're toxic. They're ultra-processed filth. They've got no nutritional value and they're going to make you very sick. And what's more, I wonder how many of these uh, National Trust properties, along with our hospitals and schools and football grounds, are also secretly serving yeah, why halal do, meat. Why do, you, why do you associate veganism with healthy eating necessarily? Yeah. These are just people who don't want to eat meat. No, exactly. But no, what I'm saying is often these well, I don't want to eat healthily. I want to eat very unhealthily. stuff is uh, pretty it's my bad choice. for you. Yeah, but, I mean, that, why is veganism necessarily a healthy form no, of it eating? It isn't. No That's one ever said it was. Aye. Uh, mind you, there you are. Uh, we're at mind the end you, uh, of uh, an the end. hour. Thank you very much to Peter Blexley. <laughs> Coming up Thank after the break, it's not a happy Easter for Rishi Sunak as a new poll shows the Conservatives are projected to win under 100 seats. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> there was a suggestion by some 
that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, uh, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to Cross Talk. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And we are with you live from 1 until 3 p.m. every weekday. Coming up in this hour, it's total Tory wipeout as a new poll reveals the Conservatives are on course for their worst ever general election result. And in Scotland, new hate crime laws come into effect today despite widespread condemnation as critics say they could have a chilling effect on freedom of speech. And meanwhile, unperturbed by an international manhunt, it appears the gourmet gangster, Christy Kinahan, has been posting hundreds of reviews and pictures online from his alleged hideout in Dubai. All that coming up, but first let's get the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Good afternoon. The body of a toddler has been found in the French Alps almost nine months after he went missing. Emile Soleil was two and a half years old when he disappeared from a tiny village, sparking nationwide shock. He'd been dropped off at his grandparents' house hours before. Detectives are investigating whether or not his death was an accident or if he was the victim of a crime. An SNP minister says J.K. Rowling could be investigated by police for misgendering people. The author wrote a series of tweets on X aimed at trans people shortly after Scotland's new hate crime law came into force. New offences have been introduced for stirring up hatred based on prejudice towards protected characteristics. They include age, disability, religion, sexual orientation and gender. Hundreds of patients have died unnecessarily each week in England due to A&E weights. That's the finding of a new study from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. It found there was likely to be an excess death for every 72 patients who spent 8 to 12 hours in the emergency department. And the longer the wait, the greater risk of death. Poppy Coburn from The Telegraph told Talk Today, it's just another sign the system is in crisis. Absolutely the opposite of what you want to be hearing. You want to be thinking... When you're in the A&E ward, you're going to be safer. But a friend of mine had to go to A&E recently and said it was just unbelievable. The, the, just There's not enough staff around. There are people sitting out in the corridor, the waits are over 12 hours, if you're lucky. I think it probably shows that we cannot just wait until the election to put off the crisis in the NHS. Energy bills have now fallen to their lowest level in two years as the new price cap comes into force. A typical amount for gas and electricity has dropped by an average of £238 to £1,690 a year. But experts are advising people to continue saving as bills remain expensive. Seven major bills, including council tax, water and broadband, went up today. Meanwhile, lower paid workers are getting a pay rise. The government's increased the minimum wage by more than a pound to £11.44. 
A major new poll suggests we could see a Tory wipeout at the next election with the possibility of just 98 members of Parliament. The Salvation poll is predicting the worst ever Conservative Party defeat in history, which could see 14 serving ministers and even the PM, Rishi Sunak himself, losing their seats. It's being branded an extinction-level event, but the Sun's Rod Little told Talk Today that's what people always say, and it won't turn out to be true. The Conservative Party has remarkable uh, survivability uh, 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 talents and has shown that over the years, uh, sadly, in my, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, uh, because I, it may well have outgrown its usefulness, given that there is nothing you can really say that stands for conservatism anymore when you look at the various factions within the Conservative Party pulling in very, very different directions indeed. Finally, a ghost has been rocking around the clock at the old International Hotel in Las Vegas. Elvis Presley is thought to be haunting the venue where he used to perform in the 1970s. His stepbrother, David Stanley, claims he can feel his presence, saying he asked the ghost to show him a sign and the lights flicked on. That's all for now. Time for your weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, the weather's going to stay pretty unsettled over the next few days with showers or longer spells of rain. And we've certainly seen some very heavy rain working its way northwards through the country today, giving some particularly bad driving conditions. A lot of surface water and spray on the roads and a lot of gloom around as well. Low cloud making it very misty and murky. It's an onshore flow into the northeast, so it will be quite chilly in those areas too. In contrast, northwestern parts of Scotland should see some decent sunshine and will probably stay dry as well. And then to the south, well, a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. These showers heavy and thundery at times. However, they will become increasingly confined to southern coasts. So a drying out process as we go into the evening. But then also this rain making its way further north into Scotland and returning to northwestern parts of England. Now, of course, all that cloud and rain doesn't mean that it's going to be fairly mild. Most places frost free tonight away from the extremely far north. And then through the course of Tuesday, well, that rain hangs around Around, particularly over central and eastern parts of Scotland. To the south, we'll see another mixture of sunshine and showers and temperatures into the mid-teens Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. We have lots coming up over the next hour, including the most dire poll yet for the Tories, a controversial new crime law as well in Scotland, which promises to crack down on hate, long A&E waiting times, needlessly killing 250 people a week. And we'll tell you all about the drug kingpin who's getting away with leaving restaurant reviews online, despite being one of the world's most wanted men. Uh, but the big news, of course, Alex, is uh, my new column, which starts next Monday in yeah, the Yeah, congratulations, Kev. I'm Thank incredibly you. proud of you. It's great to see diversity happening in elements of our written press. The Guardian, of course, always labelled as an extremely right, uh, right wing? Yeah, not <laughs> Left -wing really. Left-wing newspaper. <laughs> but it's great that they've got you and uh, you on board to uh, throw your... Uh, Two bit into the mix. Alternative voice. Alternative voice. Uh, I won't uh, fit in well with what most of the people on The Guardian says, but here's to The Guardian for uh, having a broad enough church to embrace uh, my uh, appalling, far-right, uh, disgusting, racist Brexit opinions, yeah? Yeah, no, definitely. And I think, they, you know, they always, they've got this whole site, don't they, on The Guardian called Comment is Free. How much are they paying you? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not doing it for free, let me tell you that. Yeah, I wouldn't blame you. Uh, I'd be very spicy but, too. Uh, uh, the, the other big story of the day uh, is, of course, the uh, hate crimes in oh, Scotland, God. the new hate crime law, uh, which will uh, police people while they're sitting at their own dinner tables uh, and their own coffee tables in their own homes. I hope Hamza Yousaf is very proud of this legislation. I just legislation. don't understand how we've got to a stage now where we have law saying that if you've said something which someone else doesn't like or is offensive or however horrible it is, you could end up seven years in prison. This is the sort of legislation you get out of an authoritarian fascistic state. Oh, say that and we're going to put you in prison. Putin would be proud of that. Look, I actually think everybody should be allowed to hate me, 
be misogynistic, make blonde jokes, do your worst, say the West Country accent is thick, I don't care. If you think that, fine, joke about it, fine, you're not going to hurt me, so, you know, crack on. This idea that you can actually throw someone in prison for it is absolutely insane. And the other thing I find very disturbing about this is part of this legislation enshrines this idea that if you're critical of uh, gender ideology, then that is a hate crime. Well, a lot of women out there need to have the tools to be able to say, we worry about our protection when we go and use public baths or uh, public toilets or changing rooms or our kids go on girl guide camp or whatever it may be. And we want to say, well, look, you know, I'm not sure that man who says they're a woman is a really someone who uh, has good intentions. They might be pretty dodgy opportunists. Now, if that becomes made illegal, which essentially this legislation could well do. And at the same time, you're not giving women the same protections because misogyny is not part of this legislation. The sort of horrible things you've seen with the sort of, you know, the pro-trans activists shouting at women who are worried about single sex spaces, calling them turfs. They say some of the most appalling things. They actually threaten things like rape, assault, death threats. JK Rowling's had the lot of it. And they're also the most litigious when it comes to phoning up yeah. the police and saying someone's put hurty words on Twitter. Yeah. This is going to be a mess. But, it, but also it's thought police, it's thought control. Yeah. You know, if in myself I want to hate women, uh, I don't, by the way, but if I want Just to, me. I should be allowed to. Uh, as long as I don't go around actually harming women. Uh, this is about grown-ups having opinions. And uh, uh, Yams, Yamza Husaf, or whatever his name <laughs> is, uh, Hamza Yousaf and the gang, uh, they want to make what you think and what you say illegal. Blame Tony Blair, 1997, brought in the very first laws for 300 years, which made things you can say illegal. Uh, and that was the hate crime laws. Hate crime laws are a disaster, trust me. Well, we want to know what you think. Do you dare? to disagree because we'd consider that a hate crime if you do uh, do scotland's draconian new hate and crime and speech legislation put free speech in danger give us a call 03444991000 text us 87222 write talk before your message or tweet us at talk tv well your texts and tweets have been coming in this lunchtime uh, and uh, wendy j has tweeted us to say it's like something straight out of orwell's 1984 exactly wendy j this uh, makes the point. Let's remember that people have opinions. An opinion is not necessarily based on fact or knowledge. This is nonsense. How can you prosecute someone for their opinion? Exactly what I was just saying. Good point. And Becky says it will create hate complaints where none exists. That is another very gonna good point. Going to waste an awful lot very of police time point. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Never mind burglaries. We're just going to look at hurty words. Yeah. Now, to our top story, Rishi Sunak has been dealt yet another blow as the latest polls reveal the Conservatives are on course for their worst ever general election result. A seat-by-seat -seat analysis gives the Tories fewer than 100 constituencies compared to Labour's whopping projected 468. It also shows Reform UK could cost the party up to 50 seats. But the Prime Minister is determined to stay positive with Downing Street hailing the government's bumper package of economic reforms. As I said earlier, that's their words, not mine. Uh, they hailed this in a statement released last night. Well, joining us now is former Conservative Special Advisor Lauren McEvitt. Lauren, I mean, it doesn't look good, does it, for the Conservative Party? Would you be in the school of thought of go soon, Rishi, get the election out of the way before we hemorrhage any more support or let's give it a bit more time, the polls could narrow, we could still save something from this? So I'm in the latter camp, but not because I think that doing nothing results in the poll narrowing. Um, but I think that the longer that the Conservative government waits, the closer we get into August, where we may have um, more fiscal headroom to play with, the larger the chance that the government goes for a second fiscal event later in the year and a 12th of December election rather than a slightly earlier autumn election. Do you think December? I think so. Interesting, interesting. Uh, in so far as you it gives feel them more the longer room to play it goes, and do a the tax better cut later in the year, yeah. or invest in public services. So as such you don't such agree with David Frost, who, who uh, is no. pretty much quoted. Well, he's not pretty much quoted. He is quoted as saying, "Every day, in every way, the polls get worse for us. Let's go now." <laughs> yeah, I don't agree with David Frost. Um, I, 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 
generally speaking, don't, um, because I don't believe that he actually knows an awful lot about what he's talking about and how the Commons works or how um, actually running a government functions. Um, I think he has a very loud mouth and not an awful lot of experience to back it up. <laughs> I mean, the risk, of course, okay. but delaying to even later on in the year is you're going to have a sort of annual migration, uh, well, illegal immigration statistics that are going to be eye-watering, I'd assume. This summer, I don't think there's going to be much let up. Let's see. It might be proven wrong, but it doesn't seem like the wind is blowing in the right direction for that. Um, but also, it could be that the energy bills soar again come winter and all of those problems from last winter rear their ugly head and it just looks even worse than it does now. It could be, and that's the gamble that the government's got to take. Having said that, the longer that we wait, the longer the, chart, the, the higher the likelihood that reform blow themselves up, um, in my opinion. I think that they are headed for some really bad press over some of the people that they're selecting to run for the selection. Um, you've got people with track records of animal cruelty. You've got people um, who, who have, have, have had investigations for anti-Semitism. Um, you've got cranks who are in the well, strong anti-vax You say that, you say that, but I don't think that's going to work. The Conservative Party have a number of politicians who are under investigation for things such as rape. Um, you know, you've got others who have been accused of doing all sorts of funny things with tax. I don't think any party can necessarily look at their entire cohort and say, oh, everyone's squeaky clean. That's very clean. true, but not and I don't think it works for the general, That's very but true, but yeah. not every party doesn't has the leader of the party in Richard Tice going on Twitter and threatening sitting members of parliament with the compromat that their party have on them if what they don't suddenly defect to them. That is almost unheard of. I don't think that's what Richard Tice of. has done at all. Though Richard Tice loves a bit of uh, litigation, so be careful what you say because he'll be after you. But um, no, I think it's look, I, I, I'm going to find it very difficult to sort of handle this even handedly. But I think that what I would say is I think that where once upon a time back in sort of 2015 with UKIP, the attack on candidates and trying to sully and besmirch the character of uh, uh, you know, UKIP, then the Brexit Party, then Reform UK did have a real impact. And people you know, in polite society around dinner tables went, oh, gosh, I don't think I can vote for them. I just don't think it's going to work this time round. That's a gamble I think the government are willing to take. Mm. Uh, respect to, to your view about the potential uh, downside of some of the candidates at Reform UK, but as Alex said, uh, look what Labour did at Rochdale. Uh, the other parties, all, all parties have this problem. Uh, candidates uh, turn out to be not great. Uh, but uh, don't you think that the reason Reform UK present a massive threat to this government? I mean, they're being projected as a direct threat to... Uh, Rishi losing at least 50 seats and they could be a factor in hundreds more, uh, that what they're standing for, they're standing up and saying, we're Conservatives, we're what Conservatives used to be. Do you remember the Conservatives under Margaret Thatcher? That's us, Reform UK. That's why people are gravitating towards them, because they uh, have the image of traditional Conservatism, whereas the Tories no longer do. I think that there is a, a rebalancing of the political spectrum that's happened over the course of the last 18 months or so that has created space for a UKIP Brexit party type uh, party on the right uh, of the UK political spectrum that has not really existed at, uh, over the course of the last three years. I'd say that Boris Johnson kind of knocked that space out and this is uh, you know, a resurgence of that. But I don't necessarily agree with, for example, Anne Widdicom saying, you know, that that reform could be the party that breaks the two-party system in the United Kingdom. I think that it is a much bigger struggle um, to do that than they had taken into consideration. You only need to look at the Lib Dems polling figures from those two MRRP polls um, in the last 24 hours, one of which said they get 20 seats, one of which said they get 48 seats. It is actually much more difficult than people consider to understand how those more minor parties are going to shake down. A polling difference of 2% in either direction sees Labour do really well in Scotland or Labour do incredibly badly in Scotland mm. with the yeah, SNP. It is really, really hard to tell this far out. And the only poll that matters at the end of the day is the one on polling. But day. then maybe Anne is right in a sense that what she saw back in uh, 2015 was UKIP coming third in the country of millions of votes and having just one MP. And perhaps if people do say, I'm fed up with the two legacy parties, but I'm stuck in the stranglehold of a binary choice, yeah. that it may be the thing that people suddenly go that's it this system in the country doesn't work we don't want the conservative party nor do we want the labor party something at the very core has to change well no none of the big parties are advocating in favor of proportional well, representation of course they're not because it reform. wouldn't destroy and we them. did have a referendum on this um, not you know not too long ago within recent political AV, memory. AV plus. I'm still you know sleeping in the t-shirt from the No to AV campaign, so um, <laughs> it can't be that long ago. Um, and I think that, that that everybody feels that this question has been put to bed for a generation. Um, similarly to the Scottish independence question, although the SNP are obviously trying to put that back on the table uh, fairly regularly. Um, I don't believe that proportional representation 
is the answer for the United Kingdom. We've just gotten rid of it in London um, in relation to the mayoralty elections, and I think that that's a good thing. Um, but I do see that there are arguments, particularly from supporters of smaller parties, um, that they are never going to get a bite at the cherry or they're never going to be able to get into government. Um, but It becomes anti-democratic, doesn't it? If people don't get what they want to vote for, that surely is not a good thing for democracy. Well, you have... You've got to, you can only have a choice of two because our system prevents anybody else from having anything but. Well, I mean, how that does the system really prevent it? You can still go into a you polling booth and back... Your, the, you, you just argue You can yourself. still go into a polling booth and, 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 and select the third, the fourth, the fifth party. If they are not doing enough, if they are not bringing in enough donations, if they are not putting out enough press to be able to say you should come and vote for us. At a certain point, that becomes the party's fault rather than the system's fault. Um, and uh, is it enough for Rishi Sunak to basically say, oh, we've turned the corner economically, you know, inflation will carry on coming down, we won't put up interest rates anymore, uh, you're going to feel a bit better off? Uh, is that enough? Is that enough? I think it isn't enough if we go for an election now-ish. I think it might be enough if we go for an election later in the year. You know, it comes 6th of April, you've got the £50,000 uh, threshold on child benefit increasing to 60000 You've got the £5,000 increase on uh, VAT for small businesses, which is a big deal. Um, and I think that the longer some of those things have to bed in, the more people feel some of those things. Um, I, and with, alongside a prediction that inflation is going to come down, as well as, as I understand it, a prediction that um, previous figures around recession may be maybe uh, uh, recalculated upwards, yeah. we may be in a different economic situation later down later in the year. But I think that it may have been optimistic for him to say overnight that we are in a new economic uh, economic paradigm now. I think it, that, that's a slightly optimistic It seems take. to me that this is a very sort of Westminster uh, conversation that people like us who are politics wonks have, talking about fiscal headroom and this, that and the other. It must break your heart, actually. The majority of people at home are like, oh, Blimenek, the Conservative Party who played musical chairs in 10 Downing Street rather than run the country. Yeah, I don't think that our reputation has come out of the last two years looking good. Um, I think the reason why I think the reason why Liz Truss gets to go on Twitter on Easter and have everybody laugh at her once again for holding up holding a picture a of a lamb, lamb outside a church was that a had picture of a lamb. Was no, no, she was holding, holding up a lamb outside what yeah. looked like a church that had recently it was caught fire. Um, you know, a... really, just there's no winning there, I, and I think that. Every single one of those things compounds oh. a reputational issue for us, which is, as you've just done, it's laughable. Yeah. And that might be you know, the laughability factor may be what finally kills yeah. us, actually. Quick last question. Well, we've got to go to break. But uh, we know what's coming throughout the summer. It's going to be uh, bad optics. It's going to be loads and loads of migrant boats already. Uh, they're yeah. charging across. Something like 390 came over this weekend. Mm. Uh, and that's going to get worse and worse as, as the weather gets better. How bad will that be for Rishi? It's not a good look, is it? I think a lot depends on what happens with the Rwanda vote when Parliament comes back from the recess. Um, if he gets a win on being able to, to, to return some yeah. people to uh, to an outpost in Rwanda, then perhaps politically he can salvage something. If he can make you know a rhetorical win on this and say, I have been prevented from doing this, he may have some win put into his sails. Yes. At least this guy's got a plan. You know, I don't see Labour coming up mm. with a plan that says how they're going to stop this at the moment. They're just waiting for the Conservative <laughs> they don't Party have a plan to keep, for anything, to keep, to keep stuffing you, up. I'll, so, I'll tell you that Labour's entire electoral plan is this. Do nothing. Do when nothing. your <laughs> enemies are making mistakes, don't interrupt. Yeah, exactly. So we won't see much yeah. of Starmer coming up, if you ask me. Uh, Lauren, that was great. Thank, Thank you. you and much. worth so pointing much. out, actually, your former boss, of course, was uh, Secretary of State for Wales, David Jones, one of the good uns, I'm a yeah. big fan of uh, DJ. Great Good, man. You'll be glad to hear it. Great man, great <laughs> Laura there. Now, coming up after the break, Scotland's draconian new hate crime laws come into force today. But what impact will they have on free speech? I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, 
that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV. On TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, Scotland's new uh, controversial hate law, which has come into force today, is being called out by critics who claim it could stifle free speech and be weaponised to settle scores. Uh, First Minister Hamza Yousaf's new measures aim to tackle the harm caused by hatred and prejudice, but senior police in Scotland say it could undermine public trust in them. Uh, those who support the new laws insist they will make Scotland a more tolerant place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Tolerance. Yeah, yeah, right. Joining us now is former columnist for the Scottish Herald, Donald MacLeod, and The Sun's political columnist, Trevor Kavanagh. Donald, will these uh, particular laws make Scotland a more tolerant place, do you think? Um, <laughs> some of us done it again. again. No, uh, Scotland didn't have a problem, and uh, where this problem's come from, I don't know. It, it's always been regarded as an open-minded, friendly country, except, of course, when the old firm play, then it all spills out on the streets. But generally, we're regarded worldwide as a friendly, open-minded country. The message in this is terrible. It sends out a signal that we're divisive, we're polarised, that we're secretive. You know, and to me, it reminds me of, you know, in 1930, well, not that I was about, but I certainly know about it, but 1930s Germany, we've got... Putin's Russia, Zingpin's China, not to mention the rocket man's uh, North Korea. It is, to me, a snooper's, another snooper's charter, the first one being uh, thrown out because it breached uh, the um, Convention of Human Rights and scrapped. But now this one, I, I think it's more divisive, it's more polarising, it's, it, it's insidiously creeping away at our freedoms and our democratic rights to speak. Uh, let's bring you in, Trevor. You've written about this in your excellent Sun uh, column today. Uh, I mean, back in 1997, Tony Blair uh, brought in our first hate crime laws. That was the first time for 300 years that we in Britain had to be a bit careful about what we said out and about. Now Scotland has upped the ante uh, to people up there having to be careful about what they say in their own homes. So uh, if you say anything to me and I go to the police and say, Trevor Kavanagh has just committed a hate crime law against me, he said this, these awful things, the cops say, why do you think that's a hate crime? Well, because I do. Yes, sir, we will go and arrest Mr Kavanagh. I mean, it is sinister, isn't it? 
Yes, and you don't even have to go to the police. You can go to the, one of the designated reporting centres, which includes a sex shop somewhere in Scotland. Um, I mean, I was listening this morning to the uh, Scottish National Party government's um, victims minister. I mean, that sums up the dilemma straight away. Why do we need a victims minister trying to explain how the police will set about prosecuting or even investigating allegations against people for saying something described or seen or portrayed as hatred, a word which I think is totally inappropriate in any event for this sort of alleged offence. Hatred is a vile uh, and pernicious sort of emotion which should not be enshrined in a de definition of a legal offence. Um, the fact that you might criticise or say something untoward or unacceptable in the view of the person you're talking about shouldn't be defined as hatred. And if you can't upset people, then you do not have free speech. Free speech is designed to say things which to some people is unsayable. Yeah, Don, as an active observer to some of the campaigns that have taken place over recent years regarding single-sex spaces, it seems to me, from the things I have witnessed firsthand, that women stand there saying, we don't particularly want a situation where a man can say he's a woman and access our changing rooms and toilets. All sorts of opportunists will do that. We don't want them in our sport. End of. And uh, whenever they try and make this particular argument in their minds to protect themselves and keep them out of harm's way, what they face on the other side of trans activists who, by and large, spout some of the worst level of misogyny, who are extremely threatening and intimidating, sometimes going as far as threatening physical violence, sometimes resorting to a degree of physical violence. And yet this legislation says you cannot criticise if someone says they're the opposite sex to the one that they're born with, uh, but it's perfectly fine to be a misogynist. Scotland's now become a very dangerous place for women, hasn't it? Well, I think it's not just women, you know, parents as well. But on, on the women thing, you've got to remember that the, 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 the trans activists are a very, very small, uh, very vocal um, minority. I, I, but most people, they let them, you know, spew their hatred or their, their bile. But it's really as, I mean, there's more people in Scotland accept people for who they are than, than, than is made out. And we are, there is an awful lot of freedom that, and now it's, that's getting taken away. I'm more worried. I'm a bit more worried about you know the, the, the amount of bail and stuff that I come up with in the house. <laughs> when you're about ranting, yeah. I mean the uh, the police would never be away from my door in that case. <laughs> you know, uh, as it would be. You know, that's you know that's joking, but it isn't a joke. As you say, there's 400 new reporting centres. You know, as Trevor just said, they're a sex shop and a magic. A mag I was going to say a magic mushroom farm, but a mushroom farm you can go in and make a, an anonymous uh, complaint. You never know who they are. But the thing is, that complaint might not be advanced. It might not be moved on to you being charged by the police, but it's still recorded as a hate crime. And that means future employers are then able to look and ask for these records, and that will be on your record. And that's one of the very things that Myrtle Fraser, MSP up here, was was, was, was cracking up about, and it is actually taking Police Scotland to task uh, and through the courts about the SNP gender policy, his criticism. He was reported to the police, but Police Scotland didn't tell him. So you will never know if you've been reported for a hate crime unless the police turn up at your door. And I think there's more things in Scotland that the police should be doing and, uh, and working on than running out in a sex shop to get somebody complaining about somebody calling them a man when they want to be a woman. I think it's just ridiculous. Yeah, that's the point, isn't it, Trevor, that uh, uh, J.K. Rowling in particular, who lives up there in Edinburgh, uh, she could be in trouble because she uh, refuses uh, necessarily to uh, call a trans woman a woman. Uh, she says they're still a bloke uh, and she wants to say that. Now, down here in the south, in England, it has been decided that if I want to go up to a tra transgender, uh, a trans woman, and say, as far as I'm concerned, you're a bloke in a dress... Uh, whether or not they've had the surgery, I am legally entitled to do that. That might, might be offensive, that might be rude, but it's not against the law. In Scotland, that is going to be against the law. It's going to be confusing, isn't it, travelling around Great Britain as you go from country to country and uh, we find out we have totally different laws uh, that are imposed upon us. Well, thank heavens for J.K. Rowling. I mean, 
she is a very co courageous woman and luckily i think that she has the resources to back up that courage with legal advice at the highest level and what i look forward to is her being the very very first one to be arrested or at least charged with any offenses so that we can see it tested in court properly and i doubt if it's even possible to imagine although in scotland fantasies do actually exist um, that she would be convicted. I think it would be the beginning and end of a stupid law. And, uh, Donald, where on earth did this come from? Because I don't think there's much of a mandate from <laughs> democratic will to have such laws in place. How has it been received in Scotland? Uh, the newspapers going, yes, it's brilliant, what a positive, wonderful, shining, progressive day for Scotland. Or are the majority of people north of Hadrian's Wall saying, what is going on? Most people up here are banging their heads off of Adrian's wall, just going, oh, what are they doing? You know, we want a fix to our, the, the, the economic crisis that everybody's suffering in the UK, but, you know, and the hospitality industry, when you want that fixed, the education crisis that's there, the, the NHS crisis, these all need fixed and, and focused on, and as does crime, real crime. Well, this police Scotland just recently said they're not going to bother investigating with small crimes. What that is, I don't know, but there's going to be 500 officers uh, being trained, given two hours training to you know catch you saying something that they might or might not agree with. Uh, it, it is a disgrace and it, it is diversion. But there is no appetite for this up here except amongst very small, marginal, <coughs> loud groups. And I think it's driven by the Greens. I, I, I mean, the, the, the SNP's... Uh, Poodles are actually masters, I think, now. Uh, it's, I think that's what's happening up here. Uh, Trevor, is this going to cost the SNP? Because uh, they used to stand primarily for Scottish independence. Uh, that's what they focused all their attention on. Uh, but through uh, Nicola Sturgeon's regime, now Hamza Yousaf, we found out that they're not just interested in uh, Scottish independence, they're also interested in... Uh, you know, dingbat ideas like putting male rapists into uh, female prisons and now, like, kind of arresting people for what they say at their own dinner parties in their own houses. All of this nonsense, this extreme nonsense around their main mission for independence is costing them dear, and I suspect they may be facing some kind of existential crisis uh, soon after the next election. What do you think? Well, I, I do, and I think that it's richly deserved. What is surprising to me more than the fact that they are in a crisis now is the fact that they have endured and survived for 17 years in office in Scotland. I mean, Scotland is famous worldwide for being canny. Canny Scots are the ones who brought out the, who developed and launched upon the world the Enlightenment, the freedom of speech and free thought, the, uh, the, the way of uh, civic society being responsible for the welfare of its people. I mean, Scotland was the, an example that set, was set to the entire world at one point, and yet they have put up with what I can only regard as the balmy army of the Tartan Terror for 17 years against all the odds and also against all common sense. Trevor, thank you so much. Donald, thank you ever so much. It's just fantastic. still love Scotland, by the way, Donald. Full of great people. It's just the yeah. SNP that yeah. uh, get on our nerves. I, I, I want to be done. You're pretty, I'm calling you Specky, right? So let's see what happens. Yeah. OK, right. Uh, good to talk to you, Donald. Thank you very much, Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, both. Now, we've been asking, uh, with a view to all of this, do Scotland's draconian new hate crime laws <laughs> put free speech in danger? <laughs> is and that your, glorious? Yeah, yeah they, do, they do, by the way. Uh, <laughs> there is no such thing as free speech, free speech now. Yeah. And your point. texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast on this, this lunchtime. Reg has shared his concern that I'm worried this new law is just open to abuse. Well, yeah. Uh, it is. Curtis says, soon you won't be able to trust anyone in case they report what you say to the authorities. Authorities. This is how you divide society. And Carol says it's a total affront to free speech. Chilling. Uh, next, more than 250 people in England are dying needlessly each week because of long waits for A&E care. That's according to a new research out today by the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. Well, Rishi Sunak had hoped to hit his targets by now of 76% of all A&E patients being admitted, transferred or discharged within four hours. But 
This seems a long way off with this new data showing 1.5 million patients had to wait more than 12 hours in major emergency departments over the last year. Yeah, I think what Rishi meant was uh, four hours while you're alive, uh, not what after you die. Uh, the long waiting times have been blamed on insufficient funding, resulting in too few staff and not enough beds. Well, joining us now is Celia Arsan, an A&E doctor and NHS commentator. I mean, these are shocking figures. When you think, what, 250 A&E patients dying each week, so that's a thousand a month. And we're just talking about A&E patients here. We're not talking about late diagnosis of cancers, late diagnosis of heart conditions, so on and so forth. I mean, this sort of seems to me, if your legs hanging off and your eyeballs popped out of your socket, well, never mind. You may as well just stay at home and make the most of it and pop some paracetamol. No, it's not like that. And, uh, you know, my heart goes out to everyone who does need uh, to go to A&E and, &E and uh, you know, whether it's the patient themselves or their loved ones. Um, and uh, again, also, it's not, as you said, Alex, it's not just the people in A&E. &E, there are others. We haven't even included um, the, the awful plight of patients who can't even be offloaded off of ambulances. That figure is not within this. And the other thing I want to add to this, I've been an A&E doctor, I've worked within A&E for more than 10 years now. <coughs> the first time that I um, started to make films and, and, and content on uh, the stresses of A&E was back in 2013, that's 10 years ago, when the Royal College of Emergency Medicine then put out an alarm, a warning to say, we are facing an existential, existential threat uh, within emergency medicine and patients' lives are at risk. So, the, you know, the, the former uh, college president said it would feel like John the Baptist just calling out in the wind. No one's listening. And still, no one's listening. This is why we have got those horrific figures now. And it, it, it's harrowing. It, it's that it's multifactorial as to why, but there is a system. There is a process. The re, we are backlogged in a &E because we've got nowhere to move the patients to. The hospitals are full for various reasons, and it's because healthcare within the hospital has been seen as a for, for far too long. Even though we've been trying to change it as a separate entity to what's going on in the community. These are joint up figures. If we can't discharge people out of hospital beds, there's no, there are no beds for the patients who are stacked up in a &E to go to. That's why. Yeah, and uh, of course, this is one of uh, Rishi's five big promises. Apart from stopping the boats, he was going to get NHS waiting lists down. Uh, why has he not succeeded in that, Saleya? And uh, what does he need to do to make the situation better in a and &E? Do you know, uh, it would be wonderful if he just listened, if the people, so, you know, or, um, and, and also the people that work for him, you know, within the various offices, already in some of the sort of responses to this staggering and really horrifying figure, um, it, it, you know, our defensive comments from the Department of Health and Social Care saying, look, We've already done this. We've already done that. We've, you know, they've they stated in response that they've added an extra five thousand permanent staff beds. Well, that's not transpiring into real uh, improvements or impact on the ground. So instead of being defensive about it, let's sit around a table and properly listen. We, as as a, a specialism, as as a profession within healthcare, we really don't feel that in the last, I don't know, since. 2013 when the first 2012 ish when the first um warning was put out by the royal college of, Emer royal college of emergency medicine don't feel that we've been properly listened to and everything that we warned about over the last 10 years has come to pass it needs it, you know it, this is serious people's lives are being lost and there's a huge amount of suffering when I'm taking a little break out of emergency medicine, I'm going back in the next month or so, you know, I know what I'm going back into. It's going to be harrowing. It's not as harrowing as for the patients, but staff um, face that. They face that every day. It takes a toll. People get burnout. People get stressed. People take time off sick because of what they're seeing every single day in, day out. Can you imagine going to work and just seeing people suffering, lying and dying on trolleys? That's a horrific thing to contend with every day. I mean, 
How much of this is also about looking at how the system works in the UK in general? Because I get the impression very often that the A&E becomes a pinch point because people haven't been able to get access to, say, a GP, and they're worried about their child who's had an infection for a week and they're phoning and phoning and they can't even get through on tele telephone tombola to the reception desk. Or even I had a circumstance. I needed a cast changed after breaking my hand in France and I went ping-ponging back and forth between that NHS helpline, the GP surgery, and was told to go to a &E. &E, which to me was ludicrous. When you go and you're on the A&E rounds, how many people waiting in that waiting room do you think actually need the sort of critical care that A&E is, is offering? You know, I think sadly now it is getting to the point where the majority of people that are in A&E need to be there. There is increased demand. We've had winter infections. We have ha we've got an elderly population um, uh, who need care. Social structures, as I said, within the community have broken down. Um, people are not get not getting access to things that they could get access to in the community. Um, I think there's been far too much playing around with something that was actually working to a degree um, that could have worked you know back in 2010 i think we had the highest satisfaction within the nhs things were going well um i think what we've had are years and years of trying to dismantle shortcut short change um what what we had and this is now the product i agree that you know there are huge challenges within the community i have to say i've been uh, and I think with the GPs, I've got two sisters who are GPs who when they're working their socks off, um, um, working ridiculous hours uh, and colleagues as well across the board to make sure that, you know, as, as many patients as possible can be seen on on time. Um, but that there are delays, there are delays indeed. But I think that Again, something that was working has been mucked about. Um, we've had NHS bursary, uh, nursing bursaries cuts. We had a Jeremy Hunt mucking about the junior doctor's contract in 2016, around about that time. We've had um, a number of other changes that have been brought in, you know, often without consultation. And it just adds more delays, more paperwork, everyone having to reshift to how they work. I mean, honestly, if you could see what we had to contend with, you, you would really get it. I mean, I invite you to come on a chef one day, if you like, if you know, if we can get the go ahead and you'd see it's crazy. We're getting the, we're getting the sense uh, that things are quite difficult in A&E. &E. Yeah. Uh, you are relaying that very, very yeah. well, Saleha. Uh, great to talk to yeah, you as you always. So thank you so much. Saleha Hassan, uh, A&E doctor. Yeah, she, and... she actually did sort of paint the the picture really so brilliantly yeah, didn't she now coming up after the break an irish drug kingpin with a five million dollar bounty on his head has been leaving quite the trail in the form of restaurant reviews i'm alex phillips and i'm kevin o'sullivan and you are with talk tv on tv on radio online and on your smart speaker Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs>
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, an Irish drug lord with a $5 million bounty on his head has been leaving food and restaurant reviews on Google. Uh, seemingly unfazed by the international manhunt, cartel kingpin Christy Kinahan has rated and slated over 200 restaurants across the globe, but uh, the police are still struggling to find him. Uh, joining us now is The Sun's brilliant crime editor, Mike Sullivan. Uh, Mike, uh, this guy, I mean, to be fair to the cops, he did post all these reviews, uh, hundreds of them, uh, for restaurants and hotels. He was quite picky. He wanted yeah. uh, good food and fast service. Don't we all? <laughs> uh, and he did use a false name, but uh, yeah. he's called the Dapper Don, uh, as I say. Uh, he's still based in Dubai, which is where he has been since 2019. That's when there's been an international police hunt for him going on since. Uh, but given that he's been posting restaurant reviews, how come the cops can't find him? Well, I think they probably know exactly where he is in Dubai, but there's no extradition treaty with Dubai. So uh, the Americans want him, the British want him, the Irish want him. Um, he's one of the world's most wanted men. He goes around the world, in presumably in false passports on occasions, and then uses this pseudonym um, by the name of Christopher Vincent uh, to mark hotels. He, he marked a Waitrose store. He marked uh, a COVID testing centre. It's Waitrose sort of. Yeah, I mean, he seems to be a man of good taste, it has to be said, and quite a culture chap. Actually, he was... Um, I think it's probably worth telling you a little bit about Kinahan. Mm. Please do. Uh, he's the head of uh, what the police describe as the Kinahan cartel. Um, prior to this, going back some time, he served a sentence in Ireland for heroin smuggling. Dublin and, guys. Uh, yeah, he's, he's originally from Dublin, although, weirdly enough... He's got a British passport, by all accounts, which states that he was born in Perivale, oh, really? West London. So uh, yeah, there's a little bit of confusion over... But some people suggest he was born in Ireland, to father was a sheep farmer. Others say that he was born in London. So there's an air of mystery about him. Uh, but there's no doubt that he is a cultured and intelligent man. Uh, and, so he's worth it, and he's made... His, his uh, nefarious business affairs of accumulated him a fortune in the billions. Well, they have, and, but he's obviously got the brains to oversee all this. I mean, while he was in prison, so he served the sentence for heroin smuggling and later check fraud. Um, back in 2001, when he was finishing this sentence for check fraud, yeah. he'd done two degrees while he was serving that sentence, <laughs> and he actually asked to be kept inside prison instead of being given early release just so that he could complete his degree. He speaks wow. Spanish fluently, he speaks Russian fluently. Uh, so he's, um, 
Yeah, he and he obviously uh, feels that he has good taste, and perhaps he has, by the sounds of it. He looks like someone's relatively sort of camera-struck nice uncle at a wedding to me, yeah. not a sort of international crime baron. Yeah. But how dangerous is this guy? Because doesn't he have connections to all sorts of things, from jihadists to intelligence services in Russia and Iran? Is this guy actually a threat to people? I don't think. If you walk past him in the street, he would be any threat whatsoever. But if you were to go on the wrong side of him, perhaps he would be. According to the police law enforcement agencies, he's been responsible for... He's got an army of gunmen. Um, there's been a war with another family in Dublin, which has apparently led to 18 murders. Wow. Um, so... He's got two sons, and it's worth pointing out that one of his sons, Daniel, is a very successful boxing promoter, highly respected within the boxing world. Uh, Tyson Fury, uh, the heavyweight champ, has uh, spoken uh, very affectionately about Daniel. Um, but the police say that they are running one of the biggest crime cartels in the world. Um, the police uh, have the American DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, they've issued a $5 million bounty uh, for his capture. That's that's almost £4 million. So that's pretty serious. Yeah. So, And, uh, and are um, you saying that, that... So he lives in Dubai where no yeah. one can touch him? Because Effectively, right. that's right. And then, so <laughs> it was 2022, actually, when the, um, the reward was put on him. So before that, he'd been travelling here, there, Spain, Holland, um, literally across the world, South Africa... And while he was, you know, it's, it's possible to mark his movements through this pseudonym that he's used and all these reviews. So, I mean, in some ways, he's cocking a snoot, isn't he, at, at, the, at the law enforcement and saying, well, it's almost catch me if you can. But uh, they now know that uh, I don't think this um, uh, Google review identity has been used for some time, but it's quite possible that he's using another one. Who's to, who's to say? Uh, moving on, Mike, uh, do you think that I'm the sort of material, potential Guardian columnist, you think? Sorry, what, him? The me. Oh, you? What, Guardian columnist? Yeah. <laughs> I don't You're know, not... Kevin, I mean... Um, Seems unlikely, doesn't I it? I think it's pretty unlikely, knowing you as I do, but the Guardian are uh, an eclectic band go. of people. There's, here's so my column, there it is. That's your column. Right, uh, OK. Kevin O'Wokey, even. Anyway, okay. I've been telling the uh, audience all, all show uh, that I've got a new column starting next Monday in The Guardian, going to uh, okay. explore important uh, subjects like diversity and inclusivity and yeah. Keir Starmer and uh, let everybody into the country. Uh, but anyway, I've been lying. Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, possibly say. something to do with the day. Yeah, it's yeah, an I April Fool's, folk. Yeah. Unfortunately, oh, the Guardian... You've got me going. Yeah, the Guardian, <laughs> the Guardian haven't offered yeah. me a column, but now they've seen today's yeah. programme, I bet they're I rethinking. I bet they're going to be on the well, phone to your non-existent agent tomorrow. Yeah, um, my non-existent <laughs> agent tomorrow, um, my non-existent column. They might like an alternative worldview, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, but I somehow doubt it. So uh, that, yeah. folks, uh, was my hilarious April Fool. I said I was getting a column on The Guardian uh, and I'm not getting a column on The Guardian and uh, I don't actually want one, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah. That's not my kind of paper and I'm not their kind of person. So there you go. Mike Just Sullivan from The Sun, okay. thank you very yes, much. That was you. excellent. Yeah, uh, sadly, though, Alex, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. Please do join us same time tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Up next, though, is Peter Cardwell. He's in for Ian Collins. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you bright and early tomorrow. Today on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl. 
JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. That's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs>